The following program has been arranged by the Division of Game and Fish. Here is the story of the Bluegrass State's great outdoors. This is Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Afield. Welcome to Kentucky Afield. Kentucky Afield. More than 50 years. And still. Fit as a fiddle. This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. It's not often that I do a follow-up on a topic that we've already covered, but today we are, and that subject is rivers. For rivers, the discussion we had in the summer of 16 just wasn't enough. So today, we're going to carry on the conversation we had with Dr. Joe Flotimers, a river ecologist with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. He works worldwide while keeping his roots right here in Kentucky. It's all streaming your way next on Kentucky Afield Radio. Hunting elk in Kentucky is a dream come true for many, and I want to add my name to that list. And I want to add mine. If you want to add yours, the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is Elk Central. The pick four option lets you put your name in the hat for cow, bull, archery, or firearm. Plus, youth tags. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. This could be my year. And it could be yours. Register for incredible Kentucky elk hunting at fw.ky.gov. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear, flowing streams, Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund, the natural tax shelter. Charlie Baglin, and welcome to Kentucky Field Radio. Just like you, I am driven by a schedule. But when I go to a river, time stops. Which river do you live near? Do you cross a bridge each day, see that sign? Is that river a place you fish, boat? Is there a park along that river? How friendly is that river when it rains? Kentucky has 24 rivers. The Licking, the Green, the Salt, the Trade Water. The longest is the Ohio River. The widest is the Mississippi. We have some rivers that really aren't rivers at all, but rather forks of existing rivers. Big South Fork, Leviza Fork, Floyd's Fork, Tug Fork. We have some creeks in Kentucky that are longer than some rivers. The naming and measuring conventions across Kentucky history were never that uniform or carved in stone. So you get what you get. All the water in Kentucky flows to a creek or to a river. In that river, eventually, they all flow into the Mississippi River, and then they flow to the Gulf of Mexico. Do you know why seawater is salty? Salt in seawater actually comes from the rocks inland. Rivers carry these dissolved salts out to the ocean. Water evaporates from the ocean to fall again as rain to feed the rivers, but the salt remains in the ocean. You've heard the term salt of the earth? It applies here. Today on the show, we have part two of a show on rivers with a river expert from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. He is a Kentucky native from Carroll County, Dr. Joe Flotimers. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charlie. I'm happy to be here. Are all rivers freshwater? In the United States, there are some rivers, like out in Utah, that I guess you would call them fresh water, but the salinity is very, very high, for example. And it makes sense. You think about the salt flats. The mm-hmm. water running off is very salty. Uh, the conductivity in Kentucky, you know, we're, we're usually talking about something between 1 and 500 uh, microsiemens. Out west in Utah, we may see stuff as high as 200 and 300 in 1,000. So... The salinity of the water out there is is much, much higher, so it would be called fresh water, but it's very salty. And because of that, the species diversity there is very low. But there are species of fish and bugs that live there. It's, It's a natural environment, and animals have found a way to live there. 
Now, we artificially have some waters in the United States because of different activities. It's increasing the salinity, and technically they may not be fresh anymore. But it's also uh, that salinity has also created some very, very bizarre events. Um, there was one event that happened in West Virginia where there was a lot of algae. And it turned out to be an algae that's typically in estuaries, except it was in the heart of West Virginia. And it was because the salinity was high enough to where this typically saltwater algae could live. And I think it was a golden algae. We do have some strange and bizarre impacts on our environment. And those bizarre things are what really excite scientists sometimes. Sometimes they're good impacts. Sometimes they're not so good. But they're all interesting in trying to, it's, it's, uh, sometimes people call it eco-CSI, where we have something we see, it's out of the ordinary, we don't know how to explain it, and we have to put our thinking hats on, dig in the literature, call friends, and figure it out. There are people listening to this show who, of course, have heard of the Ohio River, but maybe have never seen it, depending on where you live in the state. But that basically forms the northern border of Kentucky. How wide would it be if it weren't dammed? And because it is dammed, is the Ohio River more like just a long series of lakes? I've actually looked into that a little bit, and one of the sources of information I found that was most fascinating as I was interested in how wide the Ohio River was in Cincinnati, which is where I live in Kentucky, but I work on the Ohio side. There's a lot of development happening there that's encroaching on the width of the river. I was actually working on the Delaware River, and someone there was a monument there to Roebling, who built the suspension bridge in Cincinnati. And there was a quote on that river sign that said the thing that inspired him to build the suspension bridges were that he would never build a bridge that impeded the flow of a river. He wanted rivers to be able to flow free, and he didn't want to see any piers in it. That was his guiding light when it came to building bridges, and that holds true for the suspension bridge in Cincinnati. So when he built that bridge, and the plaque on the bridge says 1865, the Ohio River was within the width of the two piers that support that bridge. But now it's on both sides of it, and it's doing well, which is a testament to his engineering. From what I've read, before the dams, you could walk across most of the Ohio River and in some way. And there's some sections, of course, that were much deeper. But, yeah, we've modified the Ohio River with a series of locks and dams, which does uh, disconnect in some way the sections of the river. And they're largely managed by pool from dam to dam. Some of those pools are long and some are short. But those series of pools... It's part of a, a river system, but they're managed more like reservoirs. And that's where we, some of the international work that we conduct actually is a benefit because we can look at lakes and rivers that are connected naturally or where lakes occur in rivers and see how the ecosystem changes and what impact we've had or how we can more, more importantly, how we can more successfully manage them. I would imagine if it has to deal with the river, you've seen it. If it's bridges or if it's dams or hydroelectric power, the most amazing thing I have seen on a river was Colorado River and Hoover Dam. What is the most spectacular thing you have seen built on a river? The most spectacular thing I've seen built on a river is I was in a meeting in Berlin. And at one point, a guy that I've published a paper with by the name of Christian Walter, he said, I want to take you someplace and show you something pretty neat. And he took me to this area and I kept on looking, and it looked like a bridge over the river. And I looked, and as we got closer, it looked like they were towing boats on the river. And I thought, well, they're towing boats to the other side and putting them back in the river. But what it actually was, they had built a canal system to where one river passed over another river. Oh, really? So it was, it was a, a bridge that had a river on it and another river running underneath of it. It was hard to look at because I couldn't get my mind around it. But engineering-wise, that would absolutely be the most fascinating and uh, mind-blowing thing I've seen on a river. As far as wildlife, as you know, I've, I have been on the Amazon River and uh, swam with the pink dolphins and seen manatees and the giant river otters. So there's uh, a lot of amazing things there. Some of the things I've seen in, in rivers in the United States are equally amazing in, in where they live and how they live. Working in Mississippi, I saw a lot of the really big alligator snappers that we would catch in nets. They were amazing to see these huge turtles. And uh, How big? Big around is the garbage can lid? Bigger than that. 
pretty aggressive but manageable. The things that were much less manageable and that I'd never, ever liked to encounter were the beavers. We'd occasionally catch them in hoop nets, and you have to bring the net into the boat to get the beavers out. And they're never, ever happy and uh, very angry, and they will run you out of the boat. They will come at you. And I I remember so many times when I would I would try to look for a place. If we had a beaver, we would try to position the boat in some place where we could grab a limb and, and, and lift ourselves out of the boat temporarily if the beaver came at us. But very, very angry animals, and with full right to be angry, too, because they were living their life in this river, and then we put something out there which collected forage, and they thought they'd hit the grocery store. They go in the net and get stuck. Doing work on rivers, you never, ever know what you're going to see. Kentucky's Dr. Joe Flodermarsh, a river expert with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. We'll have more in a moment. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Back on Kentucky Field Radio, this is Charlie Baglin. We're talking about rivers today with Dr. Joe Flodermersch. Wildlife of all kinds relies on rivers. It's their drinking water. It's a grocery store in a way, or maybe a restaurant for ducks, beavers, otters, eagles, a variety of songbirds. The plant life and the creatures that live in or on that water vary greatly from crawfish to catfish. It's more than just a channel of water flowing from a to B. Paddlefish, Joe, are unique. Yeah, the first time I saw a paddlefish was in Carrollton, Kentucky, on the banks of the Ohio River. When I was a kid, we did spend a lot of time on the river, and there were some days when uh, pollution would be a little bit higher, so and it would smell. Occasionally, we would see um, a lot of dead fish on the bank. Again, it was one of those things that I grew up with, so I thought it was normal. But I, it never felt right, and it made me sad. But it probably largely inspired what I ended up doing with my life. But I do remember I went down the road from my house, and there was a boat ramp right at the bottom of that road into the Ohio River. And I went to the right and walked up there maybe an eighth of a mile, and there was this paddlefish that was maybe four, four and a half feet long. Not a huge paddlefish, but it had this long protruding nose and to me it was a dinosaur i had no idea what it was i hadn't seen a picture of anything like that and it was right there in my backyard and i remember just getting on my bike and pedaling back up to my house and running in my dad's office who was a veterinarian and say dad i I found something on the river and i don't know what it is he eventually went down with me after work and looked at the fish with me and we talked about it and quite often we'd sit and talk about things on the riverbank. It was a place for uh, I think both of us found a lot of peace on the river. You were telling me an uh, anecdote before we even got started here is that a river is a good place to find yourself. Recount what you were saying. Yeah, working on rivers you do meet a lot of interesting people but I also frequently am taking people out on the river that don't get out on the river much or they're stuck in the office or they're from the city. One of the things I love about rivers is when you take somebody out on the river you get to see who they really are. It's oftentimes you know somebody and they're stressed out and tight and they have suit and tie and when you get them out on the river, they almost turn back into a child, and it's as if the river has a power to unkill the part of people that cities have worked so hard to suppress. And beyond getting to see those people in a different light, uh, one of the things I love about rivers is in today's society, I think a lot of times we get confused about who we are and what we're doing with our life and, and what matters. But when I'm on the water in a boat, I know who I am, more importantly, as well. It's clear to me who I am and what I value. You're on a river. You are an island. It's just you. I think that's an interesting thought because I do kind of feel as if I'm apart from everything that surrounds us. And it's easy to be focused and experience the moment when you're on a river. And uh, one of my favorite things to do with people when we're out working is to go out on the river, turn the motor off, and just drift and hear the trees, and hear the birds, and hear the small fish jumping, and hear the way the water laps against the bottom of a boat, especially an aluminum boat. And when I worked in uh, uh, doing research on smaller rivers in the south, oftentimes we would have to set nets. And we would set these nets, and they would have to be out for four hours. And what these nets were doing were collecting organisms that were drifting down the river. 
But so we'd have to sit out there for four hours around sunset. And sometimes we'd kick back. Sometimes we'd have to study. But at times where the river was working, uh, touching the boat and doing what rivers do and flowing down river and hitting branches and hitting the mud on the banks, it would make gurgling sounds and uh, sometimes even make sounds that sounded like someone talking off in the distance. Hmm. So over and over throughout my life, I, I regularly like to turn the engine off and let people hear those things. And they'll, they'll turn their head because they're like, what was that? I was like, that's just the river. You know, If you listen, you can hear it talking to you. And it's just a wonderful experience. And there's clearly been times when I've heard things and sounds on the river that made me question my own sanity. But I don't know if it was maybe it actually I was hearing things that I should have been hearing my entire life. That's profound, Doctor. I'm glad you brought that up. Have you ever seen dams removed? People have built dams. Maybe this is on a smaller scale. We definitely have a lot of dams in this country, and there's ever-increasing efforts to remove dams that are no longer licensed and no longer functional. And in, in the places, um, I've not been involved personally in efforts to remove dams. I have consulted with people on how to assess, fairly assess a river to see what has changed. Because when, some, when they take out a dam, it's still a new thing in this country. But it does change the water flow. It changes the, the organisms that are living there. One of the things it can do is there's things that build up behind dams. And those uh, immediately, in the near future, a lot of the sediments that have been held back by the dam will redistribute. So it's important. Important to understand that that's a process, and that the river is working to recover itself with its own power. We like to fish in Kentucky. Every now and then, you will hear fish advisories that there are contaminants in the water, and I don't know how much of that to believe. Let's talk about the water quality, just overall. Kentucky is blessed with a lot of beautiful rivers, and one of the things I've seen in Kentucky in my lifetime is a lot of progress has been made, and rivers are a lot cleaner. Um, the Ohio River, when I was a child, oftentimes it would be so dirty that we wouldn't go down there because of the smell. That's that's uh, this just doesn't happen now. It's we've made great strides. There's a lot more awareness by people that they expect these rivers to be in a lot better shape. Before, I think we took them for granted. Now there's increased awareness. We have a lot more awareness of what's in the river and care about the rivers. So there is some degree, I think, of expecting more. And because of that, maybe we're more concerned about what's in the river. And people may say, wow, I never heard about this when I was a child. It's not that these problems didn't exist. Is that the rivers have cleaned up so much is that we can really start to concern ourselves with some of these other issues that rivers have that were shrouded and we didn't even consider as an issue previously. So as far as comparing with other rivers around the world, I've definitely seen more impacted rivers, dirty rivers. I've also seen some rivers that are much cleaner, um, like the rivers in Patagonia. What I was working with in Patagonia is they have a lot of rivers that are very, very pristine and they're very culturally significant. Pacific rivers I was working with, there's Mapuche tribes that live in the area, and they depend on these rivers for their water supply and for other cultural things. They're seen as sacred areas. With the increasing development down there, they were concerned that there's no record of how these rivers are, so we have no indication or evidence that if they're impacted that the condition has declined. Now, that may sound like we're doing stuff in South America, and how's that benefiting us? My big interest in working on those rivers, which were in very good condition, is we collect data there on rivers that are unimpacted by different activities, and it gives us a good measure and understanding of how rivers function. We can use that information back here and say, this is what it looks like when we don't have these impacts. Because any river you go to in the world now is impacted by something. It could be air deposition. There there are no pristine rivers. There's definitely some that are in good condition, but there's no pristine. But to observe a river which maybe has one impact on it or one thing that's happening, and to be able to look at that without having 10 other things going on, that's very, very valuable information and can be used to better understand and how we can more effectively manage rivers in the United States. We had a Facebook friend pose the question, ask Dr. Flodemersch, is there a model river out there that has been, once upon a time, not in the best shape, contaminated, that has cleaned up its act? 
is there one that we can actually look to and say, this river stands apart now and we can use this as a standard? I think a very good example of a river that a lot has been done that's been actually used as an example um, around the world is the Ohio River. There's a multi-state basin commission called Orsanco that works on the Ohio River, and all the states on the river contribute to that, and they regularly meet, discuss the issues they're having, they work with industry, and because of that, we manage the river in a very different way than we did years ago. And we look at it as an entire system. And that organization also has scientists that work on collective questions that maybe a single state cannot afford to answer, but they can answer with the collective resources. That model is very unique to look at an entire basin, especially a basin on the order of the size of the Ohio River, of interstate basin commissions. That model has been looked at by other countries, by other places in the United States. So I think it's a good, good example that we have here locally of how things we're doing are used other places. Is there anything that I personally can do to keep rivers clean? The first thing that comes to my mind is I would tell them to take the hand of somebody who's never spent an hour or a day on the banks of the river and walk with them down to a river and just sit. And invariably, everything gets quiet and you can see their face relax, see their eyes soften, see their spirits soften. And they begin to see rivers that are all, in most cases, around us and we drive them and we cross them, drive over them and cross them on the way to work. And they'll pause across that bridge and drive just a little bit slower because of that memory. So if I had to pick one thing that we could all do to help, it's just to take people who haven't had the opportunity to sit on the banks of the river and let them listen. You do that with your children. They take fishing poles with them. Absolutely. Rivers are the topic, and our next half hour we'll look at some of the rivers that could use a little help. Plus, our fishing report is also standing by. Don't go away. You are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Baglin back in our second half hour. If you would like to hear this show again, you can find it on YouTube. Also find it on our Facebook page. Just put in Kentucky Field Radio and you will find us there. We're also a podcast. Find us on iTunes. More on rivers as the show continues. First up, our fishing report. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District. Our two main reservoirs, Rough River Lake and Nolan River Lake, are both at Winter Pool, holding steady with temperatures in the mid 40s. At both Rough and Nolan, Crappie anglers are doing well in the mid to upper parts of the lake, fishing the shallow shoreline brush. If you don't have a boat, no worries. Many uh, anglers are doing well just walking the shoreline in the upper reaches of the lake. Uh, Again, fishing the creek channels and some of the brush piles they can see. If you want to fish some of our smaller impoundments, anglers at Peabody report picking up some nice crappie, and they're doing well there on the mine lakes. Lake Mose, Lake Malone, anglers are picking up crappie up there as well. Our Finns Lake have all been stocked with trout in the last week or so, and also in Otter Creek and the Otter Creek Outdoor Recreation Area in Mead County. Just remember, please be safe when you're on or around the water. Hi, this is John Williams with the Fishery Report for Southeast Kentucky. This time of year means walleye running up the major rivers, and with this warm weather we've had, that's probably happening a little sooner than normal. So look in the Big South Fork and Upper Cumberland below the falls around the mouth of Laurel. Or walleye, those can be caught on jigs and minnows. Also in that area, uh, crappie fishing can be very good in late winter, early spring on jigs and minnows or jigs and crappie jigs. Elsewhere in the district, Brickyard Ponds over in Knox County will be stocked with trout this week. Those can be caught on a variety of baits including inline spinners and small crankbaits, so give those a try. Elsewhere with this warm weather, we've got bass shallow in most of our lakes. The spinning jerk baits or shallow presentation should work for those. As always, good luck, good fishing. In western Kentucky, down at Kentucky and Barker Lakes, it is just about springtime fishing weather. The crappie are biting. We've had some good year classes of crappie, and so a lot of 10-inch to 12-inch crappie being caught. But as this water temperature warms up, there's also some crappie starting to be caught up shallow. So it looks like right now it's going to be an early spring. Bass fishing, same thing. Water's warming up. This fair weather we're having, bass are starting to move up onto the points, shallow water brush. Not saying you can't still catch some big ones out deep, but things are starting to look like spring on Kentucky Lake. 
the tailwater fishing. I'm hearing some good reports of striped bass, white bass, and hybrids in the tailwaters. So it's a good time to come to Kentucky and Barker Lakes and start your spring crappie fishing season. This is Paul Reister, and I hope you find a good day to go fishing. Dear Mom, thank you for all the times you told me to go outside. Putting me on trails put me on the right path. If you wrote Mother Nature a letter, what would you say? That's easy. Thanks. Thank you so much. You're amazing. And so are you. If your license plate at home or at work says nature's finest, you've helped protect nearly 100,000 wilderness acres across our state for all to enjoy. And we're not done yet. Explore more at heritageland.ky.gov. There's one thing better than being the captain of a ship. And that is being the captain of a canoe. They take you places barely found on a map. Still, there's something dire in their wake. Nationally, canoes account for nearly twice the boating fatalities as personal watercraft. The same is true for kayaks. So if you take your solitude seriously, Captain, take along a life jacket. Your life jacket's got your back. A message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Hunting elk in Kentucky is a dream come true for many, and I want to add my name to that list. And I want to add mine. If you want to add yours, the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is Elk Central. The pick four option lets you put your name in the hat for cow, bull, archery, or firearm. Plus, youth tags. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. This could be my year. And it could be yours. Register for incredible Kentucky elk hunting at fw.ky.gov. We're back in our second half hour. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio. It was back in the summer of 2001. I was attending a dedication event at the Salato Wildlife Education Center in Frankfurt. Have you been? A new exhibit was opening there back then, which was called The Living Stream. There was a waterfall on it. You can actually walk under this waterfall and look through a viewing window that lets you see into this huge pool of water. You can see fish in there. You can see plants, sunken logs, rocks, everything that makes up aquatic habitat. And the waterfalls themselves feed the stream that winds downhill and it goes through the bobcat exhibit and then on down to the dragonfly marsh. The living stream, it's sort of like a thread that shows how water connects the dots out there. And while I was standing there at this event, I heard someone say, and if you want this to look like a real stream in Kentucky, you need to throw in a few old tires or maybe an old washing machine. You know, we think that water will just wash problems away, wash litter away. We have 9,000 miles of beautiful fishable streams in this state. And we can be proud of most of them. But some areas we can't. In some places around the globe, this has gone on to extremes. China has problems. There's a river in L.A. that is in desperate need. And Dr. Joe Flodermersch, how have we here in Kentucky been able to dodge some of these problems? I don't know if we've avoided things that are faced by other countries, but what we have done is we've dealt with some of those issues. We have several examples in this country, most of which are before my time, where rivers were heavily polluted. They were simply looked at as drainage areas. We've moved beyond that, but some other countries haven't moved that way as much. We have shared experiences that we can share with them that promote and we can share strategies of how we've successfully confronted those issues in the United States. The Yancey River, is yep. that one of the more polluted on planet Earth? I, I would find it hard to believe that that was one of the most polluted because I, I think there's a lot of rivers that where we don't get data from that are used as dumping grounds internationally. But I've read several papers and reviewed several papers uh, for journals on the Yangtze River, and there are some issues there where countries are rapidly developing or have new technologies, and they don't quite yet have things in place to understand the impacts of those 
or how to manage them. And that's a valuable place for international collaboration because we do have methodologies for understanding an impact and looking at the total loadings on rivers from multiple facilities where if you just had one thing happening, it may not overload a river. But if you have five of the same thing going on, it's too much. ABC News had a story out back in April of 2016. They presented their list of threatened rivers around the United States. And without going through all of them, they talk about what the threat was. Outdated water management, harmful dam operations, mountaintop removal. All of these things are human-related. Are humans picking up on that? Yes. I think the fact that we have these lists and they're making the news is a huge step forward. When we were young, Charlie, I don't think we saw these kind of things. We rarely saw anything about the environment in the news. And the fact that we're now seeing environmental issues on the news as a regular issue is a huge step forward. The list you're talking about with endangered rivers, when I look at that, that to me is a very good sign that we're caring about the resource in a very different way. We're saying there's rivers that we like, there's rivers that we care about, and we don't want to see them decline in their quality. Some of the rivers that I see put on these type of lists, they're in very, very good condition, but they're at risk. They may be a pristine river, and maybe there's some development going on, and people don't want that. So we're not trying to figure out how to put these rivers back together from scratch that have been heavily impacted. We're on the front side of this now, where we're looking to protect rivers in a, in a new way, and th that's a big step forward. So these lists, to me, are a good sign. They're not a bad sign that we're losing the battle. We're, we're ahead of it in trying to prevent decline. What makes you happy about your job? What makes me happy about my job? Uh, one of the things that I find most rewarding about working with rivers is I do get to go to a lot of interesting places. A lot of times they're not the prettiest rivers, but sometimes I do get to go to some wonderful places and uh, see rivers that are in good condition. And that's because we need to know what it looks like unimpacted to better understand how to uh, heal or help rivers that are impacted. But regardless of what river you go to, the people you meet on rivers uh, and the people I get to work with are usually very, very genuine people. They're there working on this issue because they love it. They're not there because they're going to get rich on this issue. They love it. They care about it. They see it. They smell a river. When they smell something that smells like the river they grew up on, they smile. It's a part of them. And that's, that's really where I see us going in this country as far as the management of our natural resources. A lot of the views and things we've heard through the years is like, this is what impact we're having on the environment. And it's, it, this is bad, and we need to protect this, and we need to protect that. But the growing trend that I'm seeing, and it's, it's a very wonderful thing to have the opportunity to see, as we're beginning to consider ourselves a part of the environment rather than something apart from it. We're a part of it, not something that just impacts it. And when we begin to see our, and recognize that we depend on the environment for our own well-being and that and it's okay that we're a part of it, I think we enter a new mindset as for how we manage and how we take care of these rivers. I, I think it's perfectly fine that humans are on this planet. We're a natural thing. We have a desire to have things, but we can do it in a way that doesn't ruin the environment, in a way that impacts our own well-being or the well-being of other people downstream. The old song, Old Man River, it just keeps rolling along, gives us a sense of permanence. Maybe it's something that we can take for granted because it will always be there. Have we been misled? Sometimes I've had people comment to me about, oh, I think it's wonderful that you're trying to protect rivers and I'm concerned about rivers. Um, deep inside, I'm not worried about the rivers. They're going to be fine. They're going to be fine long after we're here. What I do worry about and what I do care about is the people that live on rivers, the people that depend on rivers, the people that love rivers, and everybody on this planet falls into that category. We need rivers. They are the conduit that connects us all through this country and throughout the world. So the fact that we're considering them in a new way, it's for our own well-being. It's not protecting the rivers. We protect them because they protect us. You spent your first day of life on a river. What was that story? Um, I did grow up in... Uh, 
Carrollton, and there's the, the Kentucky River, the Ohio River, the Little Kentucky River. We were surrounded by rivers. My mom and dad were very, very much river lovers as well, and they had a, a small boat that they often stayed on on the weekends on the Kentucky River, a little place called Ehlers Boat Dock. But mom and dad were there in July of 1965, and my mom woke up and poked my dad and said, hey, it's it's time to have this baby. And uh, my dad got up, went to go get the car, and found out that he was blocked in by about 20 cars of people who decided that was a good night to be on the river. My dad ran to the first boat and started shaking the boat and to wake people up and say, we're having a baby, we need you to move your car. And those people got up and started waking other people up to say, hey, we got to move the cars to get this to get this lady to the hospital. So when they finally got everybody up and got the cars moved and got my mom in the car and started driving to the hospital, my dad said he looked in the mirror and there was a whole line of cars behind him. And evidently, everybody, it's a tight-knit, tight-knit family yeah. in the river, those the people that hang out. And they all decided to go to the hospital early in the morning with my mom and dad and uh, stayed in the hospital until I was born. And that turned into a, quite an event at the hospital. And after I was released, everybody caravaned back to the boat dock. So my mom went into labor with me on the Kentucky River. And I spent my first day and first night on the Kentucky River. Nice. So I wasn't born on the river, but I think it's probably as, about as close as you can get in Kentucky this day and age. Another interesting family note is that when I was working with a scientist from Germany, uh, the first time I met him, he goes, oh, he had a very, very German accent. He's, he goes, your name is very interesting. And I said, why is that? He goes, because it fits what you do. And I, I said, well, what what does that name mean to you? And, and he said, Flotemersch, which is my last name, is from the northeast part of Germany, maybe on the Oder River. And it, it it's an old German name for people that live on the floodplain, the, the float in the marsh, the marsh being the floodplain, the float being the river. The tie with rivers, um, unbeknownst to me, actually goes way back in the family lineage. You come by it honestly, then? I'd like to think so. I like the fact that you're the brother of the man who designed the dash of the 1992 Oldsmobile 98. (laughs) If that doesn't make you somebody, I don't know what does. Harry, my brother, is an engineer. We we took quite different paths. But uh, interestingly, when we get together, we talk about um, the work he does. He works now problem solving, where a company will have a problem, and he'll go in and meet with the people that are there and listen to what they're saying and try to solve the problem with his experiences from other, working with other companies and other in industries around the world. And it's very, it parallels very much what I do. I go to places, I talk to people, I work with people, I hear what they say, and based on what I've done for a living, it, gives, it hopefully gives me some insight in what other people have done in the United States or in other countries on how they can address that problem because we need people who have an expertise and can be a specialist on something and that's hopefully the niche that I can fill for a lot of people is they haven't had the opportunity to see rivers around the world and see the the many diverse problems we have and the options for solutions. Back with our final few minutes on the show on rivers part two. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Charlie Baglin, we're back on Kentucky Field Radio with our remaining moments with one of the nation's foremost experts on rivers, Dr. Joe Flotermersch with the United States Environmental Protection Agency. He works in the Cincinnati office, but his home is in Kentucky, and he's a Kentucky native, born and raised up in Carrollton. We had this gentleman on some months ago, and we were discussing rivers. We were playing river songs and telling river stories and learned a lot about rivers and realized that in one show we really couldn't cover it all. So we invited him back for part two. Those early influences and outreach by Fish and Wildlife definitely, definitely changed my life and and set me on the direction I'm in. And you worked for Fish and Wildlife. I did. Later Um, in life. When I finally made the decision to go into what we'll call the area of Fish and Wildlife, um, I was studying at Murray State University, and I found out about a program in Kentucky where you could work as a fisheries technician. And I applied for the job and felt very lucky that I got it. And uh, I worked as a fisheries technician for three years, and the people I worked with uh, were... uh, 
Terry Prather and Benji Kinman. And it was a wonderful experience because I got to travel the state and see different lakes and different streams and see how they were managed and see how people treated these guys. I mean, because people, when they saw fish and wildlife come up in a fisheries boat and they were interested in what I can do to make fishing better, those those people were pretty appreciated by the people who love to fish or even depended on fish for a food source. Sometimes in those summer months, I would also get to work with a gentleman with Fish and Wildlife that worked in the non-game program named John McGregor. And John was in charge of the non-game program, as you know. And Non-game meaning things like things turtles we, and frogs and snakes. Things we didn't hunt and fish. And so I got to go out and help him with bat surveys, uh, snake surveys, uh, exploring caves, looking for cave salamanders that might be endangered. And that was a whole new area of wildlife and fisheries. And I, after after I graduated from Murray, I ended up actually working for John for a while before I decided to go back to college. And uh, John seemed to know everything about everything. He was a, a tremendous naturalist. And I remember I'd say, John, what's that? And he would tell me. And I'd say, John, what's that? I've never seen that. And he would tell me what it was and tell me what it was related to and why it was important that we cared about it. And we were out, I think it was Red River Gorge. We were doing some bat work, and I flipped over a dead log. Uh, we're looking for salamanders, and there was a beautiful, beautiful crayfish. It's blue and red. It was a, I know what that was now, but that's, it was Camberus uh, dubius was the name of the genus of species. But I flipped it over. I saw this amazingly colorful crayfish, and I said, John, what's that? Like I do, it did every day. And he said, I don't know. Why don't you figure it out? And the fact that he didn't know what this was startled me. Hmm. And I said, well, I'm going to go back and find the, the the key to crayfish of Kentucky and figure out what it is, which surprised me that there wasn't. And uh, there actually was very little available on them, and my curiosity grew because I wanted to figure out what it was. And that single event is what led me down the path to study uh, crayfish taxonomy at Eastern Kentucky University under Genter Schuster. And that event cascaded into where... I ended up in Mississippi because I was studying with Ginter Schuster and we were talking about streams and we, then we got to rivers and he said, well, there's, there's not a whole lot of research that's been, that's been done on rivers and uh, I know you love rivers, so why don't you do that? So it was the first time when uh, I had combined what I grew up loving and my care about rivers with something that could really cascade into a career. And uh, as I started looking for schools to study, it was very hard to find schools in the United States at that time which had programs where you could study the ecology of rivers and how to um, manage them and how to take care of and manage the fisheries. And just by chance, I found an announcement for a program at Mississippi State in Starkville, Mississippi. And there was three professors there that seemed really focused on rivers. And um, about a week after finding that, I had an old Ford pickup truck at that time. I got in the truck. I drove all night. And I was standing at a professor's door by the name of Don Jackson the next morning after I'd driven all night with my suit on and said, I need to talk to you. And he said, well, what about? And I said, I like what you're all doing down here, and I want to be a part of it. And he said, well, you have to do this, this, and this. And I had to take a lot of tests. And... The results of the test were not available, and I was already packing my bags. And when I I packed up my truck, I drove down there. I didn't have a place to live. I I was not accepted by the school, but I found a place to live, and um, I was there for about two weeks before he kind of scratched his head and said, "Well, look, I don't have a job for you. I don't. You're not approved yet, but if you want to start, you can start." And a couple months after that, all the responses came in from the tests, and I made the program, got accepted, and I was there for five years before I came back up here uh, and worked for EPA. But working with Don Jackson was interesting. Um, He had actually, before he went to Mississippi, he was in Alaska. Before he was in Alaska, he was in Owenton, Kentucky, as a preacher. Hmm. And he and I were out in the field working one day, and he said, now, he goes, did you, you didn't know I was in Owenton, Kentucky? And I said, yeah. I said, you know, I spent a lot of time in Owenton working with my dad. And he goes, I had an old dentist friend that was my best friend when I lived up there. And he goes, and he, he was uh, spent a lot of time in Vietnam working with people who had been hurt in the war. And I looked at him and I said, was that John Newcomb? 
And he goes, yeah, how'd you know that? I said, John Newcomb was a very good friend of mine. So I grew up in a little town in Carrollton, went through this route of seeing somebody with a crayfish that led me to Murray State, talking to someone who led me uh, to rivers that took me to Mississippi, went down there on a whim with a truck and no job, met a man to work with and find out that his best friend was one of my dad's best friend, and we'd actually grown up swimming in the same pond. Nice. That's a small world after all, isn't it, Joe? It is absolutely scary sometimes how these connections come back around. Joe, Dr. Flodemers, thanks a million for coming by. Charlie, I appreciate the invitation. I was very happy to be here. If you like rivers, but you haven't heard our first show with Dr. Flodemers, we did that back in the summer of 2016. It's available to hear. Go to our YouTube channel. Just put Kentucky Field Radio in there. You'll find our playlist. And then search down to July, what was it, I think July 16th of 2016 and search rivers you'll find it great river songs you'll never look at the subject of rivers the same way again in fact when that show aired i sent the doctor the youtube link so that he could hear the show we recorded the program and i don't know that he ever heard it so i sent him an email and i sent him two i sent him three and then several weeks pass and i wanted to read you the response i got from this guest that to me was touching. It was a private email, but I'm going to share it here now. It says, Hi, Charlie. I am sorry for the slow response. When you sent this email, I was on an island off the coast of Venezuela. A few days after I arrived there, I started feeling a little sick. So I visited the Island Medical Center. I intermittently spent the next four days on a plastic cot in an unair-conditioned back room of this clinic. And while there... I was misdiagnosed three times before they finally concluded I had an acute appendicitis. By this time, I had already suffered some complications. He said it took him 15 hours. He had to travel by cargo plane, then by ambulance, and then by taxi. But they finally got me to the hospital in Caracas for surgery. Right before they put me out, the doctor said, I don't know how you're still alive, but I am going to keep you alive. After that, I had a week in the hospital there after the surgery. Then he made it back to the United States, followed by another week of recovery in Tennessee, where his family lives. In short, he says, I'm lucky, and I'm taking a break from adventure for a while. But he says, while he was in recovery down in Tennessee, I listened to the show, this link that I had emailed, He said he listened to the show twice, and he says, working with you on this was a rewarding experience. It's the first time, he says, that I have pulled my thoughts about rivers together, and it somewhat seems to have rekindled my love and passion for the work and why I got into it to begin with. What an amazing gift. Thank you for your role in this. Your friend, Joe. Quite the ordeal. That's why I do this show. You can take pride in nice people doing extraordinary things to make what we have out there last a little longer. We're out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside outdoors again here on Kentucky Field Radio.